Hello and welcome back to my beach resort toy box. I'm here with Rapunzel once again <laughs> because her frying pan makes an excellent substitute for a tennis racket. And I know you can use the frying pan pack with any character, but I kind of like Rapunzel for this, so I'm sticking with her for this episode. Last time we showed you how to play tennis with two players in the toy box over here on this court. And today we're going to show you the single player variation of tennis. This variation was inspired by my tennis trainer and it uses a super cannon to launch a tennis ball at you, which you must then return. You get a point for each ball you return and of course it has to go over the net. If a ball goes out of bounds on your side of the net and crosses the line and into the sand, then that means you failed to return it and once you fail to return three balls, the game is over. So let's go ahead and try it out and uh, show you how it plays. And I put the challenge maker over here directly across from the other one. And here we go. All right, so when you're ready to begin, you can step on this trigger to start the process. And here comes our first ball. <laughs> that was a good hit. And fortunately, the way that it launches it, you have plenty of time to react get to the ball and line yourself up to make a shot. Don't have forever, but you can usually do this pretty easily. And if you're watching this and you're thinking, gosh, this is looking like it's ridiculously easy. When we get to the build exercise, I'm going to show you an alternate set of settings that will make this almost impossible to play. It's super, super difficult. And in that configuration, I've actually only ever returned it one time. <laughs> so if you want a real challenge, there's another way to do this, but... Oh no! <laughs> ah. Oh no! <laughs> this isn't good. Ah. Oh! <laughs> now we're in trouble. Get up, get up! <laughs> I don't know if I can get there in time. Ah, uh, there we go. That's the other part of this that makes it a challenge. <laughs> That's why you don't play too close to the net, either on this version or the previous one, because uh, that can happen, so. Whoa. And the further you stay back anyway, the better chance you have of getting into position and getting your shot lined up. Whoa! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, that was lucky. <laughs> that second hit corrected it. Ah, that one went out of bounds. Oh no, I gotta get back over here. Oh no! <laughs> get up, get up, get up! <laughs> Whoa. Ah. <laughs> that was a fortunate recovery. Despite all my hiccups here, I'm actually doing pretty good. I've only made it past 20 one other time. Oh, get back. Oh no! <laughs> Ah, where am I? Oh no! <laughs> go, 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 go! Miss those things! 
<laughs> Given the speed that thing goes, it doesn't usually go out the back of the uh, port. Usually that's the problem. Oh, I thought that was the last one. Ah! And there we go, that's the game. 22. Not too bad. <laughs> so that's my single player variation of tennis. Now I'll show you how to build it, and I'll also show you how to tweak it to make it more challenging. Again, in case you're thinking this game is way too easy. If you don't want to stick around for the build part of the video, I hope you'll leave a comment before you go and let me know what you think of this version of tennis. Now on with the build. Okay, let me start by reviewing the creativity toys that you're going to need. I've put down most of them. There's two left that I haven't done. But I'll get to those in a moment. So <clears throat> first thing I'll point out is that I've got three trigger areas around the player's side of the court. These are set up the same way they were for the other, the other court on the other side. The only difference is this one ended at the net. This one goes beyond the net down to this point. And if you look, this is about the size of one block. So that kind of gives you a measurement of how far down that trigger area goes on this side and the other. And each trigger area, again, is a block wide. And over here I have a trigger. I've got a locator behind it here. This is where the player will start. Notice that it's right on that terrain seam. I've got two logic gates and another logic gate over here around the corner. We have our challenge maker. We have a counter, our scoreboard, a time delayer, falling object generator, a button that we're going to use just temporarily to help us kind of place the path and do a reset on it. I have a sound effects generator, another locator, and a super cannon. All right, and we are going to reuse the kill switch from last time, which is sitting over here. Okay, two more toys that you're going to need. You're going to need a fourth trigger area for the return zone. And to do that, I'm going to show you how to place it because this is a little bit tricky. I could just show you the final result, but it's easier to see how to put it in place. So this is going to sit right in here, right up against the edge of the neighboring terrain here on the right, and the left edge is right on that terrain seam. And then we're going to resize this, and first I'm going to adjust the height, so we're going to drop it down to half the height, and then we're going to bring it all the way across to there. So that's our return zone. That's going to determine when we've returned the ball. Now the path is the other one that we need. This is for the super cannon and the locator to move back and forth along. And we're gonna place this path right over here, half a block or one little nudge past this terrain seam. And we're gonna put it one notch above that trigger area. So this is actually one, two, three nudges off the ground. One, two, three. All right, so we'll drop that and then the other point is going to go on the opposite side of the court in the same relative location, about a half a block off of that terrain scene. And we'll exit. So just those two points is all you need. And since we're right here, let's go ahead and um, hook up the shooter first. So on the path properties, I'll open the logic menu, go down to properties. Active, we're going to leave on. I'm going to change the speed to 50 and we're going to turn off auto start objects when connected. All right. And the placement of this is very important. 
if you place this back any further, the ball will hit these and just bounce back on its own. Or likewise, if it drops in here, it'll roll forward and hit these and bounce back. So this is about the best place for it. You could go a little bit closer, but the problem with that <clears throat> is it starts to interfere with this trigger area. And you could actually return the ball right into the super cannon, have it shot back, which isn't what we want, and you wouldn't get credit for it. So the placement of that path is very critical. It's right on the edge of that trigger area below. All right, so there is the path. We'll hook up the super cannon next, so we'll open the logic menu for that, do a new path connection. And we'll connect that to the path. And then we'll open the properties for the super cannon. We're going to set the tilt position to 45 degrees. The toy box path, uh, part of this. So for this we want 100 off. I think all of these are good for the defaults, except movement style needs to be back and forth. And that's how you set up the super cannon. And then this locator is where the ball is going to drop. So before we hook that up, let's connect that to our falling object generator. So we'll do a new locator connection on that. There we go. And then on the locator, we can do a new path connection. We'll put that on the path. And fortunately, that does not jump, so we can still select it. We'll look under the properties for the locator, go to Toy Box Path. And for this, these are fine. The vertical offset, we're going to set this to 8. The forward backward offset, we're going to set to minus 1. And then the movement style again is back and forth. And then, uh, oops, let's go ahead and hook this button up and then we can use that to reset the path and see what it looks like. So new logic connection when pressed, come to the path and do a reset and stop. And then we can push the button and see what it looks like. and that moves the locator up to where it needs to be. And you'll notice it's sitting right up here above the muzzle of the super cannon. So that's the setting that you want. That will give you what I've got um, in my version. And when we get to the end, I'm going to tweak this and show you the other configuration. But for right now, let's leave it like that. All right, so there is the shooter, and that's uh, going to move back and forth along the path. All right. To begin this whole process, the player will step on this trigger. And I could have just had the um, challenge maker automatically start it, but I kind of wanted to give the player a moment to collect themselves and get into position and ready to go. And they might want to wait for the super cannon to get to the middle, perhaps before they start it. So that's what this does. And the trigger, because I only want to do this one time at the very beginning, that's why we have the logic gates here. So on the trigger, we're going to do a new logic connection when stepped on by player any. We're going to input into this gate. And I only want to do this again one time. And so I don't want to do it when the game is not active. So we're going to come to the level starter over here that we put down last time. And we're going to do a new logic connection on Catalyze. I'm going to come over to the logic gate and close it. And what that means is that the challenge maker will need to start that. We'll need to open it when the game starts and close it when the game ends. 
So on the challenge maker, we'll do a new logic connection on invites accepted. Come to the logic gate and open it. And on the challenge maker, a new logic connection when the game is ended. We will close the gate again. So that keeps the gate, the button here, from working when you're not in a game. But again, we only want to do this the first ball when you first start it. And because I can't make this turn around and close itself, that's why we have this second logic gate. So on output from this gate, we'll come over to this gate and input. And on this gate, new logic connection on output turn around and close that gate. So it'll only happen one time. All right. So the logic gate then, the other thing this needs to do is a new logic connection on output. We're going over to the falling object generator and we'll have it generate the tennis ball. And that will put it at the locator position It'll then drop into the super cannon and get launched. All right, so that takes care of the launching of the ball. Now scoring, uh, once again, is going to be handled by this one. Going out of bounds is going to be handled by these. So let's do the scoring first. So on this trigger area, we're going to do a new logic connection when entered by a physics ball. And I haven't set up the scoreboard yet, but that's okay. Uh, we can still come over and make this connection. We are going to increment by one the score for player one. And a new logic connection when entered by physics ball on that same trigger area. I'd like to play a sound to let the player know that uh, they succeeded. So we're going to come over to our sound effect generator, go to vocal and cheering. And we don't have stadium stands here, but that'll give us the cheering, which will be kind of nice. On this trigger area, a new logic connection when entered by physics ball. The next thing I want to do is come over to the kill switch and defeat that ball. That'll remove it. And then we need to generate a new ball. So one last thing on this trigger area, new logic connection when entered by a physics ball. We're going to generate the new ball. And I could come over directly to this but that's going to be kind of quick. What I've discovered is it's a little bit better to give the player a moment to uh, position themselves and get ready before the next one launches. So we'll do a start delay and then new logic connection on delay completed. Then we'll generate the next tennis ball. And the one second delay here is fine. You don't need a big delay. It's just you don't want to see the ball immediately vanish and the next one immediately start coming over. Um, I want to give a moment for the player to enjoy the applause. and um, So, yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't need to be a long amount of time. And if you took this time to layer out, you'd see what I mean. It's just a little too quick when it happens. So that time to layer just adds a little bit of a natural time buffer there, which I like. All right, so that is it for this trigger area for the return. Now, when the ball goes out of bounds, just like on the other side, there's a couple of things we need to do. In every one of these three trigger areas around this side of the player's side of the court needs to do the same thing. So we're gonna route those through this logic gate here. So on each of these, we're gonna do a new logic connection when entered by physics ball. Do an input into this gate. And I'm going to go ahead and make that same connection for all of these. 
I didn't do that last time, but I'm going to do that this time because I want to demo the uh, insanely difficult version of this. So on this trigger area, new logic connection when entered by physics ball and put into this gate. And again, you could connect each of those trigger areas up directly to what they need to go to, but this makes, uh, this lim reduces the number of logic connections you need to make. All right, there's four things we want to do here on this one. So, first of all, a new logic connection on output. I'm going to go to the sound effect generator and we're going to play that buzzer sound like we used in the air hockey. I think uh, I could have done that for the two-player version as well. I don't know that it necessarily needs it, so I didn't hook it up, but I found it's very helpful for the single-player version because you don't have a second player that can see the ball go out of bounds when the uh, first player doesn't. So that's why that buzzer sound is definitely needed over here. All right, on this logic gate, new logic connection on output. We want to go to the kill switch and remove that ball. So we'll defeat it. Next thing we'll do is a new logic connection on output. We're going to go to our counter, and I'm going to use this counter to keep track of the number of misses. So we want to increment that by one, and we'll set that up here in a moment. And then finally, on that logic gate, a new logic connection on output. The last thing we want to do when the ball goes out of bounds is create a new one. So once again, we'll go through this time delayer to do that and start the delay. All right, and that takes care of the ball going out of bounds. So we've got the ball getting shot, we've got the ball being returned, we've got the ball going out of bounds. The last thing we need is the logic for the game structure itself. So let's go over to the challenge maker. And if you look at the properties, we're going to be using all of the default properties here. So you don't need to change anything, except you might want to change challenge type to start on foot, but that's not really necessary. And then we'll do a new locator connection on the challenge maker. We'll connect up to this locator over here. That's where the player is going to start. On the counter, look at the properties for that. The target count is going to be three. Visible display is going to be off. Target reset count is zero, and I'm going to go ahead and reset on target reached. That'll save me a couple of logic connections. And on the scoreboard, under the properties for that, we'll set the play to to the maximum number I can set it, which is 9,999. Leave that off, and those will be the defaults, which is fine. And of course, on the sound effect generator, we want to make sure we turn off 3D sound at speaker or locator. All right, so that's all the properties. Now let's hook everything up. So on the challenge maker, new logic connection, we'll do the scoreboard first. You can probably do this in your sleep by now because this is all the same for every game. New logic connection when started. We activate the scoreboard, if I can get to it. <laughs> there is one more thing we got to do with this, though. I'll show you that in a moment. On game ended, we want to remove the display. And then when the results are closed, deactivate it. Again, we will link it for the score results. And there's the scoreboard. Now, 
In this toy box, we have multiple scoreboards. All right, we've got one now for this game. We've got one now over here for this game. In both of these scoreboards, the property is set with the visible display on. And that's necessary because if you turn that off, there's no way to turn it on even with a logic connection. When you activate the scoreboard, it will not redisplay it. So this has to stay on. The problem with that though is depending on which game you play, you could end up with the scoreboard displayed on top of the other one that um, for a game you're not playing, which means as you're playing the game, the scoreboard does not increment or it doesn't look like it is. And so <clears throat> what you have to do when you've got multiple challenge makers with multiple scoreboards, you need to make sure the other scoreboards are turned off. And so on this challenge maker, we're going to do a new logic connection. On invites accepted, we want to make sure we come over to this scoreboard and turn it off. And likewise, on the challenge maker from last time, new logic connection on invites accepted, make sure this one is turned off. And you could also come over to the level starter and have this do that same thing as well. So on Catalyze, you can make sure this is turned off. It's not a bad connection to make. Make sure both scoreboards are not turned, are not visible. <clears throat> Excuse me. That works when player one first comes into the toy box. As soon as you bring player two into the toy box, what I've noticed is, is the scoreboards become visible again. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's why I'm having the challenge makers hide those when you start. So we're going to make sure we hide every other scoreboard that we're using. We only want to see the one for our particular challenge. So that's important to point out. Because a lot of times you don't have multiple scoreboards in a single toy box, but in this case we do. All right, let's set up the counter next. So on the challenge maker, a new logic connection on invites accepted. We want to reset the counter. And then as the player plays the game and they miss balls, this will increment. And on the counter, a new logic connection you want to do, as Yoda would say, when the target is reached, you want to come over here and complete the game. So when they hit the target count of three and they've missed three balls, that's the end of the game. And that's it for the counter. <laughs> it's very straightforward. Not too many connections to make for that. And let's see, have I got everything? Let me double check. We've got the scoreboard, we've got the counter, we've got all of the trigger areas set up. We've got the trigger over at the start, launching the ball. We've got the return area set up. And yeah, that looks like that is everything. All right. Now one last thing I want to show you. At this point, we could go ahead and save our game and we're done. But if you're thinking that challenge is too easy, let me show you what you can do to make this more challenging. All right. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to come over to the super cannon, go into the properties and let's change the tilt position back to zero. So now the ball is not going to be lobbed up in the air. It's going to come out of that thing like a bullet. All right. <laughs> And that means we got to change the position of this too, this locator, so that the ball drops into the right place. And to do that, we go to the properties for the locator, go to toy box path, and we're going to scroll down. The vertical offset needs to be five. The forward backward offset needs to be one. And that will put the locator in the proper place for this configuration to work. The next thing we have to do, we cannot leave this path here in this position 
because this ball will shoot out of the back of the <laughs> court. So we have to back this up as far as we can go. And the furthest we can go is this point right here. If we back this up any further, the ball will hit these manhole covers and bounce back. So that is as far back as you can go. And believe me, you need all of this speed to have time to react. You need all that distance for that. And so now if we come out and we hit the uh, button to reset, that puts the super cannon back here. And that gives you the maximum amount of time that I can give you to react to this thing, which still, as you're going to see in a moment, is not enough. Um, and this actually... Hold on a moment. I need to tweak this a little bit. I'm going to rotate this. I think that's my problem. Because that was offset, actually. If I make that little blue dot facing forward, I wonder if that makes a difference. It does not. All right, so we need to tweak this. Properties, toy box path. So it may not be forward backward offset, it might be horizontal offset. Let's try that. I've got to make sure that's centered right over the super cannon. Both, um, both this way and this way. It's got to be centered over that. Or it's not going to work. Yeah, that's, that's correct. All right. And uh, that might be true for the uh, other configuration as well. I have to go back and double check that. But anyway, there we go. So that moves the thing back. And now let me go ahead and demo this for you. And I'll show you how insanely difficult this is. That'll also let us test the logic that we hooked up. All right, so there's Rapunzel. Oh, and I see one thing we forgot already. Let me go ahead and end the challenge. Yes, I forgot to hook the challenge maker up to the path. So on the challenge maker, new logic connection on invites accepted. We need to go over to the path and do a reset and play. And on the challenge maker, a new logic connection when the game is ended. Go over to the path and do a reset and stop. All right. Somehow I missed that on my little diagram here. All right, let's try it out again. That looks better. All right, I'm going to wait till that thing is right coming at me because I am not going to have time to move. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so you can try to stop it. And make sure you follow that thing down there. As soon as that ball disappears, here comes the next one. Oh no! <laughs> I just wanted to try. I never thought I'd actually win. <laughs> yeah, if you want a challenge, try that configuration. And see uh, how that works for you. And that ball didn't get cleaned up either. That's the other thing we missed. So on the challenge maker, a new logic connection. When the game is ended, you want to come up here and remove all. And um, just to be safe, 
We'll do the same thing on results closed. So I notice we have a ball sitting over here. I think that got dropped at the end after the game was over, probably because of this. So that'll clean that up at the end. But that's how I built a single player version of tennis in the toy box. Next time we'll move on to the basketball arena and I'll show you how to build a fun version of basketball that you can play in the toy box. Before you go, leave a comment and let me know what you think of my single player version of tennis. And if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button. Also, I'd like to remind you that I've got logic diagrams on my blog that will help you connect the Creativa toys so you can build this game in your own toy box. And as always, if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet and you like Disney Infinity, just click my photo in the lower right corner of this video. Thank you for watching. Take care.